everyone and welcome to this session for the British Council Selector Pro program. Uh, there's two days of events and things online from the 12th to the 13th of February uh, and I'm here today uh, hosting a panel uh, on keeping your audience engaged. So my name is Jennifer Lucy Allen, I'm a journalist and broadcaster from the UK and today on the panel we have three people. John Dunn who runs promotions Parallel Lines, Alex Bondarenko, who runs Lee Room in Ukraine, and Lucy Wood from the Roundhouse in the UK. And I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves because they all do a lot more than I've just said. Uh, so I'm going to let them describe a bit about their roles and uh, different uh, career backgrounds. So Lucy, do you want to start and introduce yourself to everyone? Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm head of music at the Roundhouse, which is a... Uh, uh, music and performing arts venue in London. A lot of our activity is focused on young people. We're a charity um, that delivers culture and creative um, activities for young people. And uh, I've been at the Roundhouse for 10 months now, all of which have been during uh, the time of COVID. So it's been a bit of a strange time to be head of music and in charge of gigs when there have been not gigs in the conventional sense. Um, and prior to that, I was um, the music booker for a festival called Latitude, um, which interestingly, John also uh, was the first music uh, booker for. I've had stints working at um, independent labels and um, I was a promoter for a number of years in the London promoter promotions company called Eat Your Own Ears and various bits and pieces around that, including management and working for brands too. Great, thanks. So, uh, Alex, do you want to introduce what you do? Hello, nice to meet you. It's the first time I speak alongside with three native speakers. At the moment, I'm a bit nervous about my English, but I guess you will understand me well. Uh, so, I'm a music journalist, music blogger from Ukraine. I run a media called uh, Lerum. It's the biggest media about Ukrainian music in Ukraine. Also, I write for numerous uh, musical journals, also playing in a band called Black Balloon and uh, also working for the biggest Ukrainian broadcaster called Suspilne as a musical editor. And I guess that's all. And all some numerous stuff about writing and telling about music in some media. And John? Um, I started doing shows way back in 1989. Um, quite prehistoric, lots of DIY punk shows, all the way through the Britpop era all the way into the early 2000s. And then 2003, I joined Clear Channel, which later became Live Nation, and um, started festivals and book festivals, Latitude, The Big Chill, Electric Picnic in Ireland, etc. cetera. And, uh, and then 2013, left Live Nation to start my own company. We put shows on in London um, called Parallel Lines, and we do shows um, between 50 capacity and 20,000 capacity over the course of the year. Great, thanks everyone. So the um, what I want to talk about, uh, obviously, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about COVID, but uh, and I'm going to ask you about that first. But then I also want to make sure we're still um, talking about a reality before and after this. So I'm going to start talking, asking you all about COVID and what you're doing now. But then it'd be really nice if we can sort of branch out and talk a bit more about kind of best practices because we're talking about audiences and obviously those two things are almost completely in opposites uh, during the COVID period. But I guess my first question uh, to all three of you is what your uh, working lives look like at the moment in terms of the events you're putting on and the work you're doing and whether that's a um, about uh, you're really having to react in the moment or if you're doing a lot of forward planning. Um, so I guess I'll start with Lucy again because uh, yeah, you started at the Roundhouse whilst, did you say last February? It was it was in March, but yeah. I oh, think, okay, right, you really hit the, hit right on time then. Yeah, perfectly. Um, yeah, yeah, it was so as if... What, was first, what has your first 10 months in that job looked like? How have you dealt with the COVID situation and going headlong into it? I guess, like everyone else, there was a period of time where um, the full kind of impact of COVID wasn't really known. So we started out um, postponing shows from that spring to the summer. And then those shows got moved to autumn and then, you know, further and further on. So um, 
when I first started, it was getting to grips with a shifting calendar. Um, and at the same time, we've done a series of talks and workshops and um, uh, masterclasses um, in conversations with and um, those we ran on a kind of weekly basis and some of them involved artists, some of them um, uh, music managers, you know, a whole different variety of topics and different things were, were covered. And we found that the most successful ones of those involved a lot of interactivity. So um, where you could involve the audience in a, a kind of chat at the side, if it was a Zoom um, or where people could kind of comment on a kind of Instagram live video, that kind of thing was really successful or where you could ask questions of the speaker. Um, we also delivered, we have an annual festival called Rising, which is a kind of emerging talent um, festival. And we delivered that entirely online this year. And one of the things we did, which was a real first for us, was um, a kind of resident artist. We have res a resident artist programme and um, we had a digital weekend uh, on Instagram TV, which had performances from the homes of kind of up and coming performers. And um, it was really interesting. They each kind of took the format and did something slightly different with it. So for some, it was just a very sort of straight solo performance in their bedroom. For others, they sort of turned their living rooms almost into a kind of, I don't know, top of the pops type studio with lights and everything. It was really amazing what happened. And we supported them with some of the technology they needed to kind of um, do that in a kind of slick way. Um, yeah, and I would say in terms of audiences, yeah, it's it's opened it up a bit because we've been very, obviously being a venue in London, we've attracted people from our local neighbourhood and more broadly across London, but not as many people from across the nation. And even internationally, we've had um, people tuning into some of our um some of the things that we've put out from, you know, entirely different continents all across the world, which has been really amazing. And we also suspect that we're just that bit more accessible now, because if you have any kind of barriers to coming in person to a venue, you know, most of those are erased by being able to kind of do something online. Um, so, and also I would say also for that um, resident artist weekender, I think we probably got, bigger audiences for those artists than we we would have been able to accommodate in the venue itself because they probably would have played in our studio theatre, which is 200 capacity. And they had, you know, hundreds of thousands of views. So it's expanded our reach and it's um, it also has exposed perhaps some of those um, emerging artists, but we might only expect a sort of um, a cohort of younger people to turn up and watch the shows. This is going to sound very ageist. We actually found that some of our older audience took an interest in watching some of these um, performances as well. Great. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's loads of stuff I want to pick up in there, actually, but um, I'm going to stay on track just for a minute and, and um, ask John how your experience compares, because uh, actually it's quite important to note that Lucy's in the UK, I'm in the UK, Alex is in the Ukraine, and John, you're in uh, Spain, you said. So we've all got very different sort of uh, scenarios in terms of how the rules have changed in our localities, um, especially regarding what sort of events are allowed. John, what's your, um, what's your situation been like? Because whereas Lucy's in-house at a venue, your uh, Parallel Lines is basically an independent company now. I think um, I mean, when COVID came in March, our, our last show was um, in London on March 11th. And um, and working in London, but living in Spain, it was Spain was three or four weeks ahead of the UK and actually much more stringent in terms of lockdown. The army and the police were on the streets. We couldn't leave the house unless we had a dog. And uh, you can only go to the supermarket within 200 metres. So the, the initial conversations about moving shows, uh, originally I think it was moving shows maybe back to June, July. We were already in the mindset, um, even though we we're working in the UK, living in Spain, gave us the mindset that it was going to be much longer than that because it seemed much more um, desperate here at that point than what it was in the UK. And the UK was catching up a little bit. So we started moving shows back to autumn. And um, that's just been, as Lucy well knows, it's just been an ongoing 
issue. We're just forever moving shows, the same as every other promoter in Europe, I'm sure. Um, there was a lot of talk around cancelling shows at the beginning, but tickets, you know, a lot of tickets have been sold for a lot of shows, so we just kept moving those tickets and holding the tickets. And, of course, we've now moved some shows, you know, three times, even getting into four times, and I think... I think there's a real conversation to be had actually about how many times you actually move a show and whether ethically how often you can keep moving a show. Um, but we're seeing that when we do move shows that the audience on the whole aren't looking for refunds. Um, maybe some of those more expensive tickets, the 30, 35 pound ticket, maybe if someone's lost their job through COVID, maybe they're getting that refund. But on the whole, people are holding their tickets over. And so the shows are just being put back and put back. I think what we have seen is, is a, very, a very clear difference in demographics in terms of the relation to COVID and ticket buying. For instance, we've, we've actually found this has been a period to have incredibly healthy on sales with certain demographics. So... For a younger demographic, we've put on sales, we put on shows with uh, the likes of Glass Animals and Rina Soriyama, a very young kind of 18 to 25 market. And we've done phenomenal business with, with, with those shows. For instance, Rina Soriyama show at Roundhouse for next year, 2,000 tickets, and she's, she's never been worth anywhere near those tickets. And I think that is all to do with not much in the marketplace, the hope of the young demographic, the, the, the buying of the ticket, the, the maybe the fact that they're more tuned into what's going on at the moment because they have more time at home if they're working from home um, or they're not going out, they have more income maybe than, than regular. If they haven't lost their job, they're not going out Thursday, Friday and Saturday, so they're buying tickets. And then the other side of that, of that coin is that the older demographic, um, we're noticing they're not really buying the tickets. So for instance, with like a Jarvis Cocker show where the demographic is... 35, 40, maybe those people have kids, maybe they have parents in their 70s and 80s, and they're not buying tickets um, on the on sale. So there's a very clear split as to the hope of the younger generation buying tickets for pop shows, and then the older dem demographic just being slightly more um, um, aware of the situation, really. Yeah, quite disappointed to find myself in the old old ticket buyer bracket now just over that cost but um uh alexi alex i think the thing that i'm interested in hearing about from you like given what lucy and john have said because you work in so many different areas and like you said like you're in a band you're like writing about lots of things so you've got quite an overview of what's happening in ukraine so how have you noticed um audiences and shows and the and the relationship between those um, affecting what you do uh, speaking about my job, it looks like pretty like this. So I'm sitting on the, in front of computer and writing some stuff most of the time. So it didn't affect me a lot because it doesn't change. Like you sit in the office or you sit at home. But you changed a lot what I am writing about, what I'm talking about. Because mostly we were writing about gigs. We were writing some announcements about gigs, about festivals, going on festivals, writing reports about festivals, stuff like this. But now you don't have festivals, you almost don't have gigs, so you need to find what you want to write about next. And that's an interesting situation because, ironically, you find a bigger scale uh, when the market is on the downfall. So we began to write about much more other cultural things. You begin to find some connections between, for example, music, movies, theater and other stuff. For example, my colleagues from the media Sluch began the series of documentaries writing about Ukrainian culture, not only music, but also stand-up comedy, theater and stuff like that. I think this is cool because they now have the time for it, because when you're on the run, writing about all the gigs going on in your town, in your city, in your country, you don't have time to look at this stuff from the broader scale. This interesting situation. Also, of course, everyone is looking for money, constantly. And uh, everyone is looking for some uh, new sources of money. And it's also an interesting situation because government began giving money on the grants programs uh, on the uh, fields where they did not give money before. 
because before it was like um, giving money on some online uh, activities what we can give money on some offline activities why do we need money for some YouTube festival and now it works because it feels that you don't have offline activities you need to go online and it works on all the levels and people began to understand and they begin to buy some ticket but I don't feel like uh, the online concert market is growing right now it's like people are searching for new territories and I begin I believe that in the future we will have some like uh, hybrid concerts online offline in the moment uh, that's what I see from my perspective and also of course everyone is looking for some new skills new jobs and frankly speaking I was also working on some other fields looking for it it didn't end really well but it doesn't matter so I guess that's uh, what is coming up to right now and have you noticed any change in your audience of in your readership actually yes and I think that people, if you write something about COVID, for example, in the beginning of the pandemic, you get a lot of readers. Uh, everything else was not interesting in the beginning. It happens all the time when some cataclysm, catastrophe happens. So people r read only about it. But now it's going all right and people begin to read about music, about culture, about movies, about stuff. And I think that it didn't change a lot. I think a few months after the quarantine ends and it will get back to how it been before. Yeah, one of the things I'm most interested in is uh, the idea of how to retain audiences. And John, you touched on this especially like with asking people to hold over tickets and kind of hold that hope. Um, and I want to ask all of you, actually, and feel free to like butt in on each other a bit here. Um, if you've uh, used any particular strategies or noticed anything in particular that about um, retaining your audiences, whether that's allowing, getting them to hold over tickets and asking them for support, or whether that's just getting people to engage with uh, the entirety of a live stream rather than drifting off. I think, I think at first, um, our initial um, relationship with ticket buyers was one of hands off. It was, it felt, it didn't feel like a moment to be talking about someone's latest single when people were obviously dying at the beginning of COVID and hence per now. And then there's various, there's been various other moments during the summer, the Black Lives Matter as well, where again, it didn't feel the right time to be engaging with our art, with our, with our audiences. So, and, and, and again, also with demographics, it's, it's some of those, some of those audiences I feel, feel need a little bit more engagement than, than maybe some of those other demographics within that audience. I feel that people became much more honest with their audiences. So before, when people, you have some problems, for example, with your geek or with your company, you will tell everything, but not about problems. You will say you have a bad weather, you will have you had some bad government, stuff like this. And now people say, okay, guys, we don't have money. We don't have ability to make this show if you don't pay, if you don't, if you will not, if you will return all the tickets back. So please don't do this. It will help us. And people, okay, it's honest. We, we we're going to work with it. I guess it's a big shift. I can see both of Lucy and John nodding in the screens there, if either you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, that's so, that's so true, Alex. And I think it's been a real leveller because, and I think that's not just with promoters and venues. I think that's with artists as well. I, I, you know, I'm watching now some of the artists speak to their fans. And um, in the past, it's been, you know, artists, fans, a little bit underneath. And now you can see a levelling of the ground and there's a much more transparent nature as to, you know, we're, this is a human thing. We're all in this together and we can't do this. We can do this. Um, but also, I think once the streams came along as well, that became an even much more transparent, honest way conveying, conveying the, your, your artists. So with the fact that those streams were taking place in bedrooms or, or wherever, it felt like a real leveller. And, and that in itself is, is honest, I think. Well, I think um, in normal times, our commercial music program, um, you know, subsidizes our um, young creatives program. And with that all sort of disappearing, we've had to be brutally honest about um, the support we need. But we found that people have been really supportive generally. If you um, explain, you know, this is a, pay we ran a, we an run an annual poetry slam event and um, we ran it as pay, as pay what you wish. And um, some people were really, amazingly generous um interestingly maybe this is more of a side note but 
Um, some people wanted to donate, but not buy a ticket. Some people wanted to give their money by buying a ticket, but not donating. It was a really interesting thing that there's some sort of subtle difference in um, an audience's, an audience member's kind of feeling about what they want to pay for. You know, do they want to see it as a donation or do they want to see it as a kind of conventional ticket? Um, yeah, that was kind of an interesting thing for us to discover. Have all your live streams um, then, have you been setting up different payment plans? Because um, I recently wrote a feature about kind of the future of performance post pandemic and whether live streams were here to stay and things. And I spoke to the um, head of an organization in the UK uh, called the Music Venues Trust. And he had some really quite depressing statistics about engagement with online streams and also people's willingness to pay for them. Um, and I wonder how, as the Roundhouse, because obviously you have your venue has uh, quite a sort of a staggered set of diff uh, people at different points in their career in terms of the artists you're supporting. And um, have you changed your sort of free paid pay what you want sort of strategy for those different grades of artists we haven't had very much of an opportunity to really test what people would be willing to pay for a kind of main space level act um so our main space is a three thousand capacity um room and as yet we've only had one ticketed um gig in there um which was for leanne mahavis and it was extremely successful and it looked beautiful and people bought lots of tickets um but as yet we've been unable to kind of replicate we but you know unable to find the right artist to do further shows with where the finances can stack up you know without a sponsor um it's easier for us at the kind of smaller level um i don't we did consider um perhaps asking people to pay some sort of token amount to do some of our workshops, partly as a way of um, sort of getting people to engage a bit more. And um, we'd have lots and lots and lots of people signing up and then a large number dropping away. And we thought maybe if you pay a small amount, you'll be more likely to stick around. But yeah, it's in general kind of all the different audiences and how much they're willing to pay and, you know, um, whether that is a kind of, um, there's going to be any kind of, um, long lasting um, streaming market. I mean, my sense is that there will be an audience who would like to watch from the comfort of their own homes and from places outside of London who, you know, would like to see some of the very special artists who come and perform at the Roundhouse. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily going to be every artist and, you know, it, it's going to vary hugely none of the kind of metrics you usually use for measuring um, what kind of tickets you can expect to sell for someone, they, they, they seem to be quite different for a kind of streamed market. I mean, John might have some reflections on that, but that means it's just, um, my guess would be, my personal hunch would be that it's not going to be every single show that the Roundhouse hosts will be live streamed. But I definitely think we've learned that there's a big appetite for watching stuff from home. Yeah, John, have you done any live streams uh, over this period or have you sort of decided not to? We we got involved um, with, um, early in the pandemic, it, it felt that actually we should be supporting our artists. So we got in contact with a lot of our artists and artists and got involved with promoting some of those um, those shows. It was so hit and miss. And um, I think that there was a Nick Cave show in London, which at the Ali Pali, which was a game changer, I think, because it, it set the bar as to what kind of production and what you need for it to be really, really good. I think the whole argument as to whether it will be something in the future is purely about the demographic, purely about the act. And um, I, I feel really confident about it. I think that with, again, if I take the example of Glass Animals, you know, the band like that tend to only play the major cities. If you live, you know, 100 miles from a major city, whether that be in any country in Europe and you don't get shows very often, if you're four kids who love Glass Animals and, and on a Friday night you can pay 10 pounds, 10 euros, 10 dollars, and have a glass animals party at your house and invite your friends for ten dollars. 
I think that's I think that's fantastic. I think and I think that I think that is very possible. What I would say about it is that um, the bar will continue to rise, I guess, with with these events. And it has to it has to be personal. It has to be immersive to an extent. And so with that, I think there has to be the footage for something like that just can't be the band on stage. I think you almost have to walk with the band out the dressing room, up the steps, you know, the lights go up, you get the moment of walking with the band onto the stage. You get the moment as they come off stage. You maybe get some of the build up during the day of, you know, the sound check and things like that. It's just bits and pieces, additional, additional kind of um, content. I think that's really important, but I think it's, it's, all around demographic, what kind of act um, it is. And it's, we've had the same kind of um, issues, so to speak, where we thought things would go very, very well with some of our really, really cult left field acts. And it, and it just hasn't worked at all. And then other things have done very, very well. So there is no real hard and product proof real rules with it, really. Uh, Alex, I'm interested in asking you as like a fellow music reviewer, if you've been reviewing any of these streams and how you've noticed the artist reaction, because I cover a particular sort of uh, experimental music in the UK and the, and have actually been quite nonplussed by a lot of the, because it's DIY and low budget, so you can't do a, you can't make a film, which is essentially what the um, Nick Cave show was, was a cinematic film and a musician that I know commented that all musicians have to be filmmakers now I wonder what your experiences of um live reviewing live streams in the Ukraine has been like and how audiences have engaged with them it was quite different and uh, about uh, what John was talking about it's quite hard to find a fit for your audience you're totally right about it sometimes you can only show the concert and it will be fine and sometimes you need to get you alongside with the band from all the parts of the show. And there were some interesting experiments in Ukraine. For example, there was Intercity Festival. It uh, took, it was so, four festivals, online festivals from all around the Ukraine and all around Ukraine, excuse me, and also all around the world uh, with bands playing in every city. And it was quite hard to organize, but it was working on like more than B2B and B2G models rather than B2C. So people were not paying for this, but uh, sponsors paid, uh, government gave grants, and stuff like that and it worked it was cool because it was very experimental bands and uh, guys from organizational stuff helped them to fill them they didn't have to you know put cameras uh, made the director's cuts and stuff like that uh, it was made by organizers but it will it helped them because um, ordinarily those bands will take like about I don't know 100 people on a show but on the online festivals, they got about thousands of people watching them because there were some headliners and it different than when on the real festival because on the offline festival, you go on the headliners and you don't go on other shows. Here you switch it on and it plays on the background for the whole day and you can find really cool, cool names. Uh, also, there was interesting experiment with a big VR concert on this biggest Ukrainian stadium by one big Ukrainian pop star, Alek Vinnik, who was selling tickets on this, and you could buy tickets with different ranges of engagement on the concert. You could like make a selfie with him on stage, virtual selfie. There was like dolphins running around all around the stadium. And it was really strange and weird, but it somehow worked. Perhaps it was interesting. Uh, I didn't like it personally, but it was an interesting idea from the big star who had money, who tried to do something else, and his audience is uh, not young audience at all, not at all. I guess it's 40 plus and stuff like that, so it's interesting he gets with the audience that it's not very familiar with new technologies, and he tried to engage them. So I guess it's interesting. And it's interesting about this because, to write about this because it's something new, but actually when you write about third, fourth, fifth online concert, it becomes boring because most of the time it looks the same and I guess that's the biggest problem with online concerts because most of the time it's really it's really not different. Yeah I'm interested in this kind of uh, the idea that um, uh, online concerts then can massively expand your audience beyond a, like a local geography that you would usually be focused on if you were putting on live shows but then there seems to be a barrier in um, communicate like uh, in translating that into something that for promoters is actually and artists is economically sustainable and um, so there seems to be this conflict between sort of sustainable business and sustainable audiences like 
it seems like what the, what the three of you women are saying is that there's a lot of energy and hope and audiences want to sort of support the culture that they, they love, but that perhaps the business model isn't quite up to scratch in supporting that yet for in the long term. Would you say that's true or false in terms of what you will do? I guess Lucy was right about sometimes, often, uh, audience like to donate to artists, but not to pay for the shows. Because actually, to pay for the online concert, you feel like it's uh, obvious good. You can take it all the time. You can switch on YouTube and see all Coldplay concerts, for example. You don't have to pay for another Coldplay concert, but which, which look like the same in online you won't feel the emotion but you want to donate to this artist if you feel some emotional connection with them and i don't know how is it how does it work in the uk but in ukrainian patreon becomes a big thing because artists go to patreon uh, media comes to patreon uh, our uh, directors come to patreon they're always asking for money and sometimes people just don't even need their uh, additional content they just want to give them some money to stay them alive because there are some uh, people that earn more money than the artists and they can uh, donate to people who earn less money so i guess that's the future for this stuff because you just need to uh, take connection with your audience all the time not only for one concert or two concerts try, try to make big in one day but to make it constantly during the year yeah, do you feel like, uh, perhaps this is a question best for, well, for, for everyone perhaps, is that communication, the direct communication is more important than ever between your audience and yourself, whether yourself is an artist or a venue or a pro promotions company. Do you feel like you have a more almost like personal and direct relationship with people since COVID because you've had to talk to them directly? I think... Um. Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, Lucy, go ahead. Um, I'm sure what you were going to say was way more interesting, but um, in a kind of, um, we've had that feeling that we have people talking to us now who might not, you know, you you wouldn't as an individual audience member be able to say anything really to a, a venue or an artist. Now um, people who might not have felt comfortable kind of um, asking us questions or asking artists questions now yeah have this kind of forum for networking um which is less intimidating and i wonder if that kind of levels out the playing field a bit for personalities who are a bit less kind of um, forthcoming but not entirely exactly a direct answer to your question sorry um i shall let john <laughs> it's useful um i think i was only going to say that i, I think that it had been happening anyway to an extent, i.e. the artist has been learning to speak to their fans much closely, uh, much more closer, even pre-pandemic than, um, than they had ever before. I think that the, 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 the lines there had become more, more blurred or some, smaller, so to speak. So I think as a, as a promoter, we essentially a kind of mirroring what the artist is saying to to their to their fans and we're doing the, the same thing too but so i think by 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 nature of the artist getting much more in line with their fans i think we are too and i think that's 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 been speeded up during covid but i think we were going down that road anyway actually which is which is a, is a good thing as well i think um, to sort of break it open past COVID a little bit then, um, I suppose back to, well, for all of you, but maybe back to John first, are there any um, major do's and don'ts that you've discovered or developed in, in the way that you talk to people? I think we've always been, um, personally, it's, it's around, it depends again on the act as to how often we should be speaking to them, uh, I, th I think certain demographics want more content than others. I think um, in, in terms of um, post-COVID, the, obviously the streaming thing, I think, will open a lot of doors. I think when shows sell out quickly, I think we will add stream tickets, and I, I, I'm confident that certain demographics will sell. But in terms of, so that's been the big, the big plus point. We're coming out of this, well, when we hopefully do come out of this, we'll have stream shows and there'll be that. But I think also 
there's been other things that have kind of evolved. You know, the Zoom parties um, thing has been enormous with with certain kind of demographics, which wasn't there before. And that's that's been a huge progress there. And obviously TikTok as well coming along has, has kind of opened open more doors as well. So I think uh, in terms of some of some of those some of that kind of trying to keep the audiences um, with, with some of those demographics that do require a, a lot of content. I think we've been stretching out some of the campaigns a little bit. Um, and just making... How do you decide which, uh, dem- like, uh, is that a more an intuitive thing that you've built up over the years in terms of those demographics? Or do you have a way of sitting down and uh, working that out using any sort of metrics that are available online? Um, it's, I try, I like to think it's intuitive, but then I'm constantly surprised and I turn up at shows and I, I realise that there are other old people in the room or there's lots of very young people in the room. But it's, I think it's mostly intuitive, but also there's, there's pointers around that. You know, radio helps with that kind of decision making as well, whether it be late night Radio 1, Radio 1 Extra or Six Music in the UK. Various things you can get an idea and also through your ticketing now you can break down the demographic phase simply as to the age and uh, um, the male to female ratio as well so it's a little bit of everything I think. Yeah Lucy how do you um, how often you talk to people and uh, who you're talking to and working out those do's that well the do's and don'ts really of how you do that? Well I suppose this whole period has really been a kind of opportunity to test lots of different things that we've not done before um and because we haven't needed to really I guess uh, perhaps this is too negative but for certain things perhaps we've learned that um a kind of shorter format is more successful than a longer one I guess if you're spending 10 pounds plus on a ticket for a whole gig you'll probably watch till the end if you're enough of a fan to shell that out but if you're just dipping into something to see what it might be like your attention span might wane after you know a certain number of minutes so I think have you got uh, have you worked out any actually like has there been anything that was long that you that you know like this one has definitely been too long like I want figures basically <laughs> for everyone I mean it's so different yeah again I, I reckon some of my colleagues could give you exact numbers on you know what works well for certain audiences what the length of time you should limit it to I mean there was something I think that we had um towards the beginning that was 30 minutes where I think everyone decided 15 minutes would have been better people start kind of dropping away you can see it so I think yeah you do actually um there are actual numbers for figuring this stuff out you just have to kind of run these um online almost online experiments and sort of see what in your series is successful and what's not and um yeah develop your own metrics from that but yeah I, I sorry I can't share specific um, exact numbers of minutes, but you know, shorter in general. Is this for like stream shows? Do you, you say? Is this in terms of the stream show, the live show, the stream live show? Uh, yeah, uh, I, in, I'm interested in uh, any do's and don'ts that the people listening to the talk might find useful, and if that's, it's always most useful to get actual figures. I think it's a really, a really great topic. That whole, that whole. Um, topic around how long they play for and and it's um it's sometimes quite a difficult um conversation to have with an artist or an agent but it's it's very much the same kind of conversation you have when a band plays live and and they're playing to 200 people and at the beginning of their career and you you know the weeks before you advance in the show and they tell you they want to do an hour and and you, you know that an hour is too long for a new band. And so you, you try and go, well, why don't we do 45? So you're having this kind of conversation to try and shorten the artist. But also that's quite sensitive because obviously artists want to want to play, a lot of them want to play quite a long time. But we, we blatantly know that, that certain um, artists is far too long and, and it's too long for that audience as well. Again, depending on the demographic. I found 35, 40 minutes tends to be about the, the 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 standard kind of feeling for me but again dependent a little bit on the act yeah I think everyone's been to those shows that it's like somebody you love but by the hour and 15 minute mark you're like I actually just would like to leave this room now 
Um, but and obviously people do just like you say, Lucy, like people do just drop off a live stream when they're not watching anymore. Like that, it, there's almost like a bigger demand on their time, especially if you're watching these through the same computer you've just done a day's work on. But Alex, um, to go back to the original question of do's and don'ts, do you think there's anything you've noticed um, about the way people communicate with their audiences? Because you cover a lot of different music um and you're kind of you kind of have an overview of music in the ukraine and are there any absolute don'ts or absolutely uh really good things that you've seen people do that you would recommend as ways to talk to your audience maybe the main don't i guess it might be obvious but don't treat your audience as an idiot because sometimes it happens because some now tiktok is really popular right now you have to go to youtube you have to go to instagram it's very quick formats and you have to be very quick you have to be very funny all the time you have to be viral and stuff like that and it's a uh, kind of natural when uh, like uh, young artists do this when like uh, artists working on the younger audiences do it but when artists are working on their audiences uh, that began playing like in 90s or maybe in 80s began to uh, of began to do some stuff like they're teenagers it looks at least weird but they try to do this because it's they feel that this is a place where you can find money when you can find new audience and i don't like it personally and i feel that this is the way to the to the downfall in the end because it's strategically not right people won't believe you in the future and on the other hand it's totally preferable for the younger artists to to make things like this and also uh telling about what john was talking about the consistency of the show uh, my consent is about that during these viral formats, during this all the meme stuff and stuff like this, the art is kind of disappearing in this. So uh, the artists become like an advertisers of memes. That's the problem. And because of uh, disappearing of live gigs, you can't feel the artist's real energy and you begin to uh, like follow him like a real movie star. And it's not about the music, and I don't know where it's going and where it will become, but that's the problem that I see. And about the do's, uh, just be honest, I guess that's um, the main uh, recommendation I can give. Just be honest and find some new ways to show your what are you doing. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. Uh, I just find it interesting hearing about the idea of like best practice, because I think uh, in my experience of like watching stuff and listening to stuff, you realize I think this is what you were getting at as well Alex is that actually working out what's best for you as an individual artist or as a promoter or as a venue um doesn't really matter what best practice is if you're if you know what the people you need to speak to want and that's about what you were saying about integrity and sort of this kind of almost uh it's a slightly problematic way of phrasing it but like authenticity in in some way like yeah don't talk to your audience like idiots and don't lie to them um, but we've got about five minutes to wrap up and I feel like uh, I feel like we could go for about another half an hour. And there's two things I want to ask everyone, really. It'd be amazing if there was actually some really hard, like practical takeouts from this. And in that way, um, uh, I want to ask about um, technology platforms and if there's any insider tips on things you'd recommend using, whether that's adding up metrics, whether that's a Zoom alternative, whether that's a way to stabilize your internet connection for live streams or anything like that. Um, if any of you have any things that are your sort of uh, trade secrets on in that way. Um, uh, and then also uh, to ask you about um, accessibility and whether um, the uh, you've, because of COVID, one of the things that and we touched on this right at the start one of the things that's happened is you it says uh, an audience who for whatever reason can't necessarily get to a venue and uh, whether you realize that there is a whole other audience out there and whether you're going to continue to communicate with them and if that sort of opened your eyes to something that you didn't know was there um, so yeah, that's two questions. Uh, so if any of you have any uh, comments or insider tips that you want to leave the uh, anyone tuning in with, then I really want to hear them. I think I think um, that the growth in terms of um, the streaming and the the metrics that the ticketing companies are are piecing together is 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 where is what we're seeing it's like we're we're aligned with a company called dice in the uk and very what i consider to be a very forward-thinking company 
and um, and how that's evolving. They're, they're almost opening the doors for us in terms of um, what can be done in the future in terms of the technology side of things. Maybe I can advise uh, more artists than uh, I guess that's uh... Organizers and venue holders know what they do, and <laughs> sometimes uh, new artists don't. I guess I will recommend them to dig into the new technology, every new technology they find, really, because you don't know what will be a next big thing. No one uh, believes that TikTok will be huge, and now it's like one of the major platforms for music industry in the world. So dig into new things, and uh, don't be afraid to find it, and don't be like uh, feeling like, ah, oh, it's a stuff for the children. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Well, just very briefly on um, accessibility, I think in terms of people's physical ability to come to the venue, I mean, there's a kind of financial accessibility uh, question there. And I think, again, given our remit and um, how important it is for us to help young people access culture, I think perhaps streams that are free or cheaper, you know, um, that's something I think we're going to want to um or I think it would be important to offer more of, and I imagine um, will help open uh, music up to to more people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most positive thing that's come out of the COVID live streams in, in terms of uh, people that I've spoken to is uh, people who previously weren't able to get to a lot of gigs because uh, of uh, physical access requirements. So whether they were had mobility uh, requirements or even just kind of um, not comfortable in large crowds and things like that. And now culture all of a sudden has opened up. And I think, uh, like John, you were saying, you're going to be keeping a lot of live streams. I think that's a really the most positive thing that has come out of all this. So I wonder if there's um, any experiences you've all had that have uh, actually been really hopeful uh, encouraging and giving you hope for the future of uh, sort of the live music industry. I, th I think personally, what may come out of it, uh, come out of it for me as 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 an industry rather than a, than a fan to fan or artist to fan is actually the a lot of people um, have been forced to stop their their normal lives in terms of their working lives and. Whether whether we're a venue owner, um, a writer, a promoter, a musician, we tend to live our life twenty four seven in that role, and we've all been stopped. We've all been kind of asked to pause, and and for a lot of people, that's been very very hard to do. And um, you know, they found other things in their life that that are just as important almost. And and maybe maybe. The industry was, it's always been a crazy, fast, 24-7 industry. But I think it's been spiralling. I, 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 you know, I'm kind of old enough to see how quickly things are moving and moving. And a lot of people can't keep up. You know, a lot of people just can't keep up with their inboxes. They can't keep up with the pressure. They can't keep up with the anxiety and the level of how quickly everyone needs something yesterday. But no one gives anyone the time to actually get the job done. And... One of the things that I, I I hope I'm not I'm not totally convinced, but I hope that we'll come back to an industry, and I think we might come back to an industry where people will have a little bit more patience for each other, um, and actually there may maybe a little bit less greed around grabbing as much as they can in certain areas, and a little bit more thought around actually how they're doing things, because I think um, we have been kind of going down a road where it's been difficult to keep up. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really nice sentiment and it's really important to focus on those sorts of sentiments rather than the current uh, state of things, which in both the Ukraine and the UK is it's still extremely difficult. Um, and I, I was saying just before we started that I hope that um, once the vaccinations are rolled out that maybe maybe even the end of this summer will be like what everyone talks about 1969 being is like this massive summer of loads of massive music events and culture and everyone out uh for the entire sunny months of the year um but i just want to thank all all three of you uh for joining the talk today and i hope that um everyone tuning in got something useful from this so thanks john and alex and lucy uh, and i'm jennifer lucy allen and i'm going to be signing off and say thanks very much everyone bye
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.